And I believe you have uh, something for us today? Yes. All right. You may begin when you are ready. So, I populated Daylin's room. Um, Rosalia? Oh. Rosalia, Rosalia? Something like that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, well, that's her city. That's like the name of the world. And then mm -hmm. there's the town, and there I have the people of Ken and Nessa. And so mm -hmm. I said, because like most of her stuff, well, I'm just gonna say, most of her stuff, like it's like they're farmers, there's like mm -hmm. fishers. So I said the early mild people who were pretty peaceful to their neighbors and unless provoked. Okay. Um, so at the age of 16, um, people can volunteer, like pick their trade or like volunteer to go into the military. Okay. So, um, so they can they can finish their schooling with the military, um, mm -hmm. which is only there for defense if provoked. Sure. Um, so they're not like invading other people. Okay. Um, and around age sixteen, everyone starts to kind of like get into their trade, so so that they can have a cooperative society. So mm -hmm. they have fishers who learn how to work around the killer fish from the Demon Lake. Okay. Um, they have loggers who cut down trees um, for the carpenters to build. Mm -hmm. um, they have horse tamers who take who tame the wild horses from High Fly Mountain. No, High Horse Mountain. Um, <laughs> and um, they have miners like to mine the metal and stone out of the mountain, and metal workers to use the metal okay. stuff coming from the mines. And then like other jobs like teachers and healers and farmers um, from the Valley of the Sun. Um, and in the Valley of the Sun, it grows all their food and keeps and like keeps the livestock. And the Valley keeps everything there healthy, which is so the military, like when people are wounded or something, they take them there mm -hmm. and like gives them strength. Okay. Um, and it helps with the healing process. And so her witch that everyone's not sure that there is, she does exist. Okay. But um, very <laughs> few people know about her actual existence and location. Uh -huh. Because children who are born with special gift, magical gifts are sent to like go with her to learn how to control her magic. Uh, um, okay. So the whole rumor about like she's this he, evil, there's this potentially evil, horrible witch is just to keep people out of the woods. Uh, uh, or to go too far into the woods because they still need the trees. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay. Um, and so, like that's that's the rumor, just like to protect the children when they're there with her, and then mm -hmm. protect her because people are afraid of what they don't understand. Sure. Um, and then uh, Tralia, the monster in the mountain that the, 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 the highest peak. Mm -hmm. um, so no one travels that far up just because like he can control the weather. And a long, long time ago. Someone really messed with him, and he caused a flood so bad that it wiped, that it filled the valley where all their crops and livestock are with water, and okay. so they were forced to like just survive off of what they had already like farmed and stuff, which was not fun. So it was like ex extreme rationing mm -hmm. until the valley could dry out. So they don't mess with him. Okay. And um, so they used like their currency as the like gems from the mine, um, and because the sun god like they like. Well, the sun, Valley of the Sun basically is like where all their life comes from, their food, their mm -hmm. livestock, and then it, like they can be healed there. Mm -hmm. So they worship the sun god, a sun god, or okay. the sun, um, because that's where it gives them life. Uh -huh. um, but they also treat Tralia as like a living god on earth, just because like, um, just as he says, the Valley of the Sun gives them life, uh -huh. he can take it away. Okay. So they treat him also like a god, and they offer him like sacrifices. Stuff. Okay, so there's like a, a good God who does nice things for you, and a bad God whom you have to appease. Yes. Yeah, and that's actually that's actually pretty pretty true to the way a lot of ancient world religions worked, right? Like if, usually, if you were making sacrifices like to Zeus or to Enlil or to a lot of these kind of the ancient world gods, you were just trying to get them off your back, right? You were um, giving things to them so that they didn't pay attention to you. <laughs> All right, really interesting, thank you. Okay, um, so just quick things, uh, housekeeping stuff. Uh, so we're finishing up with that hideous strength next time. And remember to complete the, voc the vocab quiz by Sunday at 11.59, and yes, that will go up um, early morning Thursday. So, yeah. So uh, that, that's when that will appear. Um, so does anybody have any questions about anything before we get started? 
Oh, and I'm also going to give uh, I'm going to give out the paper two assignment next week so we can start talking about it because we are like believe it or not we actually are kind of getting close to the end of the term here, right? And we've we've only got um, three more texts in this class to consider. Now they're they're relatively long, so we consider them over a few periods, right? But uh, yeah, we've we've not got that much time left in the term. Yeah, I was looking at copy of Dr. Strange, Mr. Norrell, like, how are we going to read this? <laughs> we'll, we'll get through it. <laughs> I, know, I know we will. Yeah. But uh, 10 o'clock last night, Ashley was looking at it, like, how am I supposed to read uh -huh. this? <laughs> well, you know, I think we, we've got it, we've got it split up into several sessions. Um, and, you know, it's if, if you know it's coming, right, you can plan for it. All right. Um, so, Let's start by talking a little bit about the head. What's the head? Yeah, it's a, the head of the nice is a literal disembodied head, right? Of a murderer. Yeah. Of a guillotined murderer from France. Yeah, Francois Lacassin. Now, The question remains whether the head really is al Qasan, right? Or whether it's merely a vessel for something else. Right? Let's look at the description that we're given of the head when it first when when, uh, when we first see it. I think that like the whole issue of the identity of the head um, seems also to be a point of contention within the uh, the nice as well. One seventy four. Okay, yeah. There's this, this conversation yeah, that Mark has with Philostrato, the physiologist, right? And actually, this is actually probably not a bad place to begin conversation about this. Um, because uh, a lot of what's going on is a kind of philosophical debate, right? So what is Philostrato's ultimate goal? What does he want to see? What does he think the head is the beginning of? Like the next step in the evolution for mankind. Yeah, it's a new, it, it, it's a, the creation of a new kind of human being, right? Mm -hmm. And what does Philostrato's vision for humanity look like? What does he think these new men are going to be like? Um, they're not going to have a need for life, death, or reproduction. Uh huh. Um, he, in his world, there's no nature, no germs. Uh huh. Um, because those are viewed as unhygienic. Yeah, yeah. He uses the word hygiene specifically, right? In describing his vision. And that not all, not all men will have this immortality. Only a select few or a select one. Uh huh. Yeah, and they just get rid of everybody else, right? So these new men will be either few in number, or singular, right? Now we can probably relate this to the way the nice conducts its business among its members, right? How do we see the members of the nice typically kind of typically treating each other? Wither is always saying that they're all one big family, right? But if they are a family, what kind of family are they? Yeah. <laughs> if they're a family, right, they're they're like the fucking Borgias, right? <laughs> I mean, they're like they're constantly betraying each other, right? Blackmailing each other, 
stepping over each other. And the whole goal seems to be like to get into this inner circle where you know all the secrets of the place are revealed to you and you get to you, you get to drink in the right club, right? The whole appeal to Mark, for example, is that the exclusivity of being in that kind of charmed circle, right? So the whole movement of the nice, right, is towards fewer and fewer people, right? You know, there, Wither is always talking in private about, you know, being able to eliminate certain people as they become no, as they're no longer useful, right? So, well, at, so, at a certain point, Feverstone will no longer be useful to us, right? At a certain point, for all her good qualities, Miss Hardcastle will no longer be useful to us. So, it's whittling down and down and down to a smaller and smaller group. Also with like Philostrata, it's just this focus on like men. Now where does he say men and women, mm -hmm. just men? Although, does that seem to be unique to Philostrato, or does that seem to be a tendency in the novel generally? Well, in the novel generally. <laughs> well, yeah. I think Philostrato, when he's talking to Mark initially about this idea, he's like, man would be easier to govern, or at least control, uh -huh. if you got this idea of reproduction, the, necess the necessity of reproduction out of the way. Yeah. Immortals don't need to reproduce, right? They really can if you're just a floating head. <laughs> There's also that, right? <laughs> it becomes a hell of a lot harder, yes. So, <clears throat> what Philostrato really kind of wants to eliminate is the body, right? Philostrato wants to destroy the need for a physical body. Meanwhile, we have this guy who's been lurking on the edges of things for the entire novel, who only really starts to come to the fore near the end of the section I had you read, read for today, right? The psychologist Augustus Frost. And when Frost is conversing with uh, Mark in his cell, we see that he has a very different view of reality. <coughs> from his colleague Philostrato, right? So Philostrato believes that mind is the only thing that is important and that the body should ultimately be eliminated, right? If we look on page 252 at what Frost says to Mark in his cell, right? It says, before going on, said Frost, I must ask you to be strictly objective. Resentment and fear are both chemical phenomena. Our reactions to one another are chemical phenomena. Social relations are chemical relations. You must observe these feelings in yourself in an objective manner. Do not let them distract your attention from the facts. So what does Frost, who is a psychologist, right, reduce all of our functions of mind to? <coughs> yeah. Every, all of our thoughts, all of our feelings are simply chemical reactions, right? So for Frost, there is only the body, right? There is only the physical material world. So what this is pointing at is an ancient philosophical problem that is at the heart of the novel's plot. Now, we don't have a philosophy department here, more's the pity. But have any of you ever heard before of the mind-body problem? Or of mind-body duality? Yeah, Ashlyn, okay. What do you know about it? So, mind-body is, um, is I'm trying to remember. It's okay, take your time. Because I, I took this with the head of psychology the psychology <laughs> department. I should know this. Uh -huh. So basically the mind body is 
Um, like, are these thoughts like my genuine thoughts, or are they the result of I'm receiving stimuli from the outside and my body is okay. reacting to said stimuli? Uh huh. Um, and it's a constant fight between your mind and your body. Like, how do I know I exist? Right. How do I know if I'm if I'm real or not? Like, uh huh. Is this just my body reacting to chemicals? Um, from the outside stimuli, or do I actually like? I know I, I exist. Like, um, yeah. The the basic question being right whether mind and body are separate things, yeah. right? I think that he quoted uh, Descartes. I think therefore I am. Yeah. Um, was his main thing. Okay. Yeah, for, um, so yeah, the famous De, uh, Rene Descartes, Descartes quote, right? I think, therefore, I am, right? So Descartes is using the fact that he has mind, right? That he, he can, that he is able to think as proof that he exists. So for Descartes, mind is primary, right? Mind is what you are. Body is just what carries your mind around. So... <clears throat> For other philosophers, um, the body is the only thing that matters. This, this is basically the line that Frost is taking here, right? That only physical relationships within your body generate your thoughts, right? The body comes first, mind is secondary. I think that one of the things that Lewis is trying to demonstrate in the novel is that he believes both of these positions, like either the, the basically the position that mind and body can be separated from each other, as um, wrongheaded, right? That in fact mind and body must work, you know, do and must work in harmony with each other. Hence the necessity of. <clears throat> Mark and Jane resolving their problems, right? You, even, you know, Jane, you'll recall from last time, is writing the thesis on the triumph of the body in John Donne, not worrying about mind or spirit, right? So most of the characters who are off in some way are more focused on one of these things than the other, right? And not on the union of these two principles. So ultimately, where a lot of this is deriving from is the philosophy of Plato. Um, have we talked about Plato at all in this class before? Or is this the first time I'm bringing him up? This is the first time. Okay, all right, good. Okay, so do any of you know anything about Plato or what Plato believed? About the nature of reality? The ethereal plane? Or okay. About, I wasn't sh I'm not sure if it's Socrates or Plato, but uh -huh. um, the idea is that if an object takes physical space and you can feel it, see it, touch it, it's real. But as soon as your eyes close and you no longer conceive it, you're not touching it, you don't feel it, you don't recognize it, uh -huh. it's not real. Um, yeah, it's sort of along those lines, yeah. Basically, what Plato believes is that everything in the physical, sensible world, right, is an imitation of an idea. So there's a mental world of ideal objects that is primary to our physical world of sensible things, right? And the sense, the, the, the things that we can sense are always inferior to the things of the mind, right? Because our senses can deceive us. And so, you know, political debates about opinion, you know, over opinion, things like that to Plato are basically meaningless because you're just you're you're only dealing with inconsequential sensory things, and you're not dealing with the real world of ideas, right? Plato's student Aristotle, meanwhile, um, is much more interested in describing and categorizing the things that we can sense in the real world, right? But from Plato derives a pretty weird ass school of thought called Neoplatonism. And this is something that arises several hundred years after Plato's own death, right? But let me give you some sense here of what a Neoplatonist believes, right? So if you are a Neoplatonist, you believe that the 
the material world is a fallen distant emanation of an ideal transcendent truth. So at the center, or at the top, if you want to think of it hierarchically, <coughs> of everything is something that the Neoplatonists call the One. And the One is this ultimate transcendent truth, right? It is transcendent because it's beyond any kind of real being, right? We can't grasp or understand the One. So the, the One is this <coughs> unknowable, transcendent, ultimate reality. And from the one come what Neoplatonists call emanations. And these emanations are inferior copies of particular elements of the one. And these emanations have copies as well, right? So on and so forth into the world that we are actually able to sense. And our world and our beings are fallen far from this particular ideal, right? We are several orders distant from the one. Is anybody confused yet? <laughs> okay, a little. <laughs> I mean, it's got me thinking about multiple realities. Okay. Like string theory, but uh, yeah. it's probably not in the same realm of what's being taught. Not quite, yeah, and partly because th this is primarily spiritual in nature, right? So human beings are several orders distant. You know, funny you should mention the Garden of Eden story and that you should mention uh, Judeo-Christian tradition because this actual, these ideas actually get kind of folded into <coughs> Christianity in a branch that doesn't really exist anymore today but was pretty popular um, in late antiquity called Gnosticism. Have any of you ever heard of Gnosticism before? No, but I'm kind of surprised that I, I talked about it. <laughs> I know what agnostic is. Yeah, so, so, so okay, so, so, so think of it. So an agnostic is someone who neither believes nor disbelieves in a deity, right? Mm -hmm. um, an agnostic takes the position that you can't know whether God is real or not, so, you know, what's the point in believing or disbelieving? Um, so this Gnostic, right, Gnostic is a word, is a Greek word that means knowledge. So agnostic literally means something like don't know. So Gnosticism presents itself as knowledge, right, you know, just kind of like induction into knowledge. And the basic tenets of most Gnostic religions, right, or most Gnostic versions of Christianity are that the material and spiritual worlds are separate from one another. That the material world is an inferior creation <coughs> that was crafted by a creator figure they call the Demiurge who is himself uh, 
an inferior copy of the real God. And for the Gnostics, matter, physical being, the material world, is evil, right? It's forever tainted, it's corrupt. So who in the novel so far can we see expressing this particular viewpoint? Nice. Part of the nice, right? Who specifically in the nice is putting forth this viewpoint? <coughs> that matter is bad and that we need to cleanse ourselves of it. Philostrato. Yeah, this is basically Philostrato's position, right? That the material world is evil and the only way to make things right is to basically strip away our bodies, right? What did that say after inferior creation? Demiurge, D-E-M-I-U-R-G-E. -E. I wrote percentage. What's that? I wrote percentage. <laughs> <laughs> that might have been what it sounded like I said with the mask on. <laughs> so yeah, so the spiritual world for the Gnostic is the real world. And everything in the spiritual world has an inferior copy in the material world, right? But this kind of duality between matter and spirit, right, is the exact debate that Frost and Philostrato are having. And for both of them, they're both taking a position that is based in Gnosticism because they're both saying it's one or the other, right? Either the body is what's real, the material world is what's real, or the mind is the only thing that's real. Neither are thinking about the ways in which these two things are united, right? And I think if we look at yeah, you know, one, one of the things we started looking at last time is that the whole structure of the novel is basically <laughs> dualistic, right? We have... Like, what, like we'll have a chapter and one will be Jane's chapter section and then it'll be Mark's. Yeah, we move back and forth between Jane and Mark, right? There, we, you know, we occasionally get another perspective character but we're usually looking over either Jane's shoulder or Mark's. And they're each associated with these two places that are mere images of each other, right? So Mark is associated with the nice at Belbury, this tacky Edwardian mansion built in imitation of Versailles. And, and uh, Jane, is associated with the group at St. Anne's. Right, this, you know, nice little forested uh, commune, right? Now we also have um, leaders at each of these places who are kind of like mirror images of each other. Right? On the one hand, we've got Wither at Belbury, and I think, you know, names like Wither and Frost are themselves symbolic. We talked about how the names of the members of the progressive element in the college, Curry and Busby, right, to Curry Favor and Busybody are also kind of symbolic. Um, but yeah, the, name, the names Wither and Frost um, kind of note the ultimately destructive impulse of the nice, right? So Wither and Mr. Fisher King, who we learn in this portion of the novel is really right, Professor Ellen Ransom, are the leaders of these respective communities, right? And Mr. Fisher King is spiritually whole and beautiful, but wounded in body, right? Whereas Wither 
we're told, you know, is a kind of handsome old man, but is mentally and spiritually vacant, right? And even the, um, the place um, is place really the, the word I want to use here? Well, they, both of these institutes represent different versions of a possible Britain, right? The nice right, is contemporary post-war Britain with an eye towards the future. And the future that they envision seems to be, at least on the surface, right, a technocratic future where everything is kind of run for you by experts. But in the end, what they're actually just trying to do is get rid of you and collapse everybody into this kind of human singularity, right? Whereas the group at St. Anne's claim to represent Logris. Now, I think we may have seen the term logris mentioned before, but uh, you know, let me know if we haven't. We talked yeah. about logris in uh, Arthurian myth, but I don't think we ever expanded okay. on it. Yeah, okay, yeah. I, I didn't think we'd really talked about it in detail, yeah. Okay, yeah, so logris is essentially King Arthur's brain. So Logris is Britain, not, it's not a historical place, right? It is a fictional, imaginary realm. And it might be helpful to think of it as enchanted Britain. seems to be the nicest general attitudes, uh, attitude towards history and towards the past? It's not like the time. Yeah, what, what sorts of things do we see the nice doing to things of the past? Oh, destroying, them. destroying them. Okay, yeah. them. Destroying them, right? So yeah, there's this village of Cure Hardy, right? That is, you know, this traditional English village that they intend to flood. Yep, they want to cut down Bracken Wood. Although they are they are also looking for something in Bracken Wood, right? Really? Yeah. Both parties are actually well like St. Anne's are like we're sure he's there. Uh-huh. But we can't go digging without a root in Bellbury. Sure. And Bellbury is still looking. Uh-huh. And how is it, by the way, that St. Anne's knows he's there? Because they're from Logris. Mm -hmm. They represent the last few people sure. of Logris. Like Miss Ironwood. Yeah. Which the names of some of the people like Ironwood. Uh -huh. It's very, it sounds very like from Arthur's Minute. Sure. But it's, they're also guided there by Jane's yeah. second sight, right? That's right, her second year. So yeah, they want to destroy Cure Hardy. They're going to cut down Bragdon Wood. And they also, uh, they machine gun that historic window in Bragdon College, right? The uh, so-called Henrietta Maria window. So anything that smacks of the past, or what they think of as anachronism, right? This all falls into their category of red tape. Now we talked a little bit about red tape 
last time. What does red tape seem to mean when the nice uses it? Uh, moral qualms and aesthetic qualms. Yeah, any kind of moral or aesthetic qualms about doing something that would advance your cause, right? They regard as red tape. And one of the Institute's sole purposes, or major purposes, right, is to eliminate red tape, right? Basically get rid of everything that's going to stand in our way. But yeah, both sides here are looking for Merlin, right? If we're looking at like kinds of doubling here, right? Remember the original dream that Jane had in the first chapter, right? What did she see in that dream? Uh, people uncovering Merlin's body and him sitting up. Yeah, specifically just, yeah, she saw his head, right? Yeah. It started with the head. So we've got two heads here as well, right? The primary dip, like, you know, the first part of the dream is about al -Qasan and al -Qasan losing his head. But then she also has a dream about Merlin's head. The difference being that Merlin's head is still attached to a body, right? Mm -hmm. So as we proceed with the narrative, um, and, you know, this is something that's going to be really kind of more important um, in the next part of this. You know, keep that in mind, right? That we've got, on the one hand, a head without a body, but the other head is still attached to its body, right? and how this relates to these particular philosophical problems. Now the other thing that, the other place where this idea of Neoplatonism comes in here is in what we learn from both Ransom and Frost about the nature of reality, right? So what does Ransom explain to Jane? Or I think actually McPhee explains to Jane about the existence of certain things that she cannot see. So can I get uh, somebody to page 188? start reading uh, from the point Miss Aesthetic he said near the bottom of the page. The point Miss Aesthetic he said is this. Dr. Ransom claims that he has received continual visits from these creatures since he returned to Earth. So much for his first disappearance. Then came the second. He was away for more than a year and this time he said he'd been in the planet of Venus taken there by these buildings. Mm -hmm. Yep. Venus is inhabited by them too. You'll forgive me observing that this remark shows you have not grasped what I'm telling you. These creatures are not planetary creatures at all. Supposing them to exist, you are to conceive them floating about the depth of space, though they may alight on a planet here and there, like a bird alighting on a tree, you understand. There are some of them, he said, are more, are more or less currently attached to particular planets, but they're not native there. They're just a clean, different kind of thing. There were a few seconds of silence, and then Jane asked, They are, I gather, more or less friendly. That is certainly the director's idea about them, with one important exception. What's that? The ill ills that have for many centuries concentrated on our own planet. We seem to have had no luck at all in choosing our particular complement of parasites, and that aesthetic brings me to the point. Jane waited. It was extraordinary how McPhee's manner almost neutralized the strangeness strangeness of what he was telling her. The long and short of it is, he said, said he, that this house is dominated either by the creatures I'm talking about or by a sheer delusion. It is by advices he thinks he has received from Ildils that the director has discovered the conspiracy against the human race. And what's more, it's on instructions from Ildils that he's conducting the campaign, if you can call it conducting. It may have occurred to you to wonder, Miss Dunnett, how any man in his senses thinks we're going to defeat a powerful conspiracy by sitting here growing winter vegetables 
and training conforming bears. It is a question I have propounded on more than one occasion. Her answer is always the same. We're waiting for orders. Okay, thank you. So these creatures that McPhee calls Eldils, as far as as far as he can tell, what are they? Okay, so they're interplanetary, yeah. Um, it doesn't seem like they have one native planet or another. Right. And they're... Do they take physical form? Yeah, no physical bodies, right? Or at least not that we can see. But certain people, at least, can hear them, right? Right, so certain individuals are able to sense them. actually talks about exactly the same thing, but he calls them by a different name. If we look on page 253, can I get somebody to read near the bottom of the page, um, starting with, uh, do you mean al Qasan is really dead? Do you mean al Qasan is really dead? Asked Mark. His surprise at Frost's last statement needed no acting. In the present state of our knowledge, said Frost, there is no answer to that question. Probably it has no meaning but the cor cortex and vocal organs in al, -Qasan, al -Qasan's head are reused by a different mind. And now, please attend Mark very carefully. You have probably not heard of macrobes. Micro, microbes, said Mark in bewilderment. But of course, I did not say microbes, I said macrobes. The formation of the word it explains itself. Below the level of animal life, we have long known that there are microscopic organisms. Their actual results on human life in respect of health and disease have, of course, made up a large part of history. The secret cause was not known until we invited the invented the microscope. Go on, said Mark. Ravenous curiosity was moving like a sort of groundswell beneath his conscience, determination to stand on guard. I have now to inform you that there are similar organisms above the level of animal life. When I say above, I am not speaking biologically. The structure of the macro so far as we know it, is of extreme simplicity. When I say that is above the animal level, I mean that it is more permanent, disposes of more energy, and has greater intelligence. More intelligent than the highest anthropoids, as uh, said Mark. It must be pretty nearly human, then. You have misunderstood me. When I say it transcended the animals, I was, of course, included in the most efficient animal. The microbe, the, mac, the macrobe is more intelligent than man. Okay, so let's stop there for a second, right? Thank you. Um, so, what is Frost's line on these macrobes? What are they? Beings with infinite energy, and um, you get you have to see it with a microscope. Uh huh. Wait, well, you can't see them with a microscope, right? Uh -huh. You can see a microbe with a microscope. Uh, but you but, can't see the macrobes. Yeah, we can't see them yet. We have no way of detecting the macrobes physically yet, right? So yeah, so they are smarter than we are. They use more energy somehow. And we can't see them. So microbe, right, micro small, 
suggests something beneath us. Macro, macro large, suggests something above us, right? So what being is Frost talking about here by a different name? Yeah, he's talking about the Elvils. He's just, instead of giving them a sort of more, you know, kind of fanciful sounding name, right, he puts it into the language of science here, right? Because everything has to be in these kind of cold clinical chemical terms for him, right? So for the nice, right, Elvils become macrobes. And any kind of mystical experience generated by the Eldils is explainable by Frost in clinical terms, right? All right. Frowningly Mark studied this theory, but how is it in that case that we have had no communication with them? It is not certain that we have not, but in primitive times it was spasmodic and was opposed by numerous prejudices. Moreover, the intellectual development of man had not reached the level at which intercourse with our species could offer any attractions to a macro. But though there has been little intercourse, there has been profound influence. Their effect on human history has been far greater than that of the microbes, though of course equally unrecognized. In the light of what we know now, all history will have to be rewritten, right? Hence the nicest destruction of anything that regards historical anachronism, right? The real causes of all the principal events are quite unknown to historians. That, indeed, is why history has not yet succeeded in becoming a science. And we have the celebration, of, like there's always the celebration of science at the NICE, right? And science apparently divorced from morality or aesthetics or history or anything that you would discuss in any kind of humanities course, right? So it's always a kind of pure science, pure engineering kind of way of going about things with no room for dissent or questioning, right? Even, you know, let's be like the, the, the most visible wing of the nice to people outside of it is a police force, right? So what Frost and McPhee are both trying to do here is explain the same phenomenon, but using the language of completely different worldviews. And they also have rather different goals as regards these Eldils or macros, right? The nice want to use the macros to kind of to, re to reshape the planet in their preferred image, right? This hygienic planet, largely devoid of animal life, right? No need for that. Let's be more like the fucking moon, right? Just a dead rock. Whereas, at St. Anne's, right, they're heavily invested in this idea of a kind of enchanted kingdom. in which you don't necessarily penetrate the deepest mysteries and strip away all illusions, right? And which is run by a group of freely chosen companions who associate with each other out of love and respect, rather than um, a backbiting bunch of technocrats who are all just kind of looking to get on and ahead in their careers, right? So, the Neoplatonism and the Gnosticism stuff um, is going to be a big element of the third part of the novel in particular, it's, which is why I introduced it today. Um, so I want you to keep an eye out for this. I want you to keep a look at this. Does anybody have any questions or comments about anything that we've talked about so far? Like you brought up how um, the nice wants to essentially make Earth the moon. Uh huh. 
Um, yeah, I mean, Philostrato like, basically says so, right? Yeah. yeah. And how, like, talking about the duality of the novel, how the moon's described. Uh huh. Mark describes it as, a, as bloodless and cold. And mm -hmm. then Jane calls it the wild moon that makes her feel, want to engage in that wildness. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's a, yeah, it's a, yeah, that, that's, that, yeah, that's actually, an, um, I hadn't thought of that, but yeah, that's, they have those very different responses to the moon as well, yeah. Um, and um, you might recall, you know, maybe not, it's just a kind of throwaway bit uh, from the, near the beginning of the novel, when um, Hingist, right, Bill the Blizzard, the Brockton College chemist who tries to leave the nice and gets killed, Right, you know, when he's uh, leaving, he's having a conversation with Mark, telling him, well, you can stick around if you want to, but I'm out of this place. Um, he refers to Philostrato as a eunuch, right? Basically, you know, as a, a, a sexless person. Um, and to go back to Hingist for a second, right, because this guy, like, he only appears in the novel very, very briefly, but he is actually kind of important in a number of ways. Um, so he's a chemist, so he is a physical scientist. But we're told that he's a chemist whose closest friends in the college are humanists. Right? He's not part of these, he's a scientist, but he's not part of the so-called progressive element. Um, he hangs around with a uh, classicist named Blossom, the guy who gets injured when they destroy the window. Um, we are also told that he comes from a very old family and indeed, his name, Hingist, is simply a reordering of the name Hengist. And I'm, if y'all haven't previously studied Arthurian literature, this is probably probably doesn't mean that much to you. But according to Jeffrey of Monmouth, who we talked about when we discussed Tolkien. In his History of the Kings of Britain, Hengist is, and his brother Horsa, are the leaders of the Saxons who invade Britain during Arthur's reign, and whom um, Arthur um, ultimately defeats. So what this does is connect Bill Hingist to this kind of imaginative history of Britain, right? His namesake, you know, maybe isn't on the right side of it, right? But he can't go along with the nice program because it's counter to um, his sense of identity. And so they kill him and frame Mark for it. Right? You know, we're told, you know, when Mark first goes to the nice, that his wallet gets stolen, and we only find out why um, towards the end of this portion of the novel. Right? You know, that the you know Hardcastle and her people stole it so they'd have something to hold over his head. And one last thing before I give you the reading questions for next time, I'll let y'all go. Have we figured out yet? What it is the people at the nice actually want from Mark? Do they? Yeah, they don't actually even want him, right? They want her to so yeah. get they, from Merlin. They want Jane so they can make use of her second sight, right? That's the only reason he's there. So, you know, that kind of self realization seems to take some of the shine off of the nice work. I didn't realize that quickly. Like as soon as they started pushing for him to bring Jane. Uh huh. But he also doesn't know about her second, second sight, right? But even not knowing that, it's been like, mm -hmm. okay, they don't really want anything. Yeah, and it's yeah, it's only when they start getting really insistent that the penny drops, right? So we're going to finish this up next time, and then I think we're moving on to uh, Ursula Le Guin and the Wizard of Earthsea.